Thank you for inviting CDA to be here. It really is our pleasure uh, to be able to be a part of the panel and also have other levels of presentation here at this meeting, and especially for CDA uh, to be the publisher of world-renowned clinical practice guidelines wherein we have a low glycemic uh, uh, recommendations within the nutrition chapter of our guidelines. We're really pleased to be here to hear all of the presentations from our colleagues and also to be the, the organization that continues to invest and also investigate how glycemic index can best help Canadians living with diabetes and Canadians as a whole. Thank you, Carolyn. That's, that's tremendous. Uh, shall we open it? I'm going to share it with Jenny. We, we, we share this. I'm precariously perched on the edge there. She's <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep me from literally falling off the edge. Uh, in, in which case, she will take over. Uh, <laughs> so if anyone doesn't like me, just get me to go in that direction. Um, but perhaps we would, we would have, I think, some discussion and some, some questions from the floor, I think, would be good at this particular point in time. Just, Saul. Sorry. Thank you. Saul Katz from Solo GI Nutrition, Solo Bars. Um, in 2006, we filed with Health Canada for low glycemic claims. So um, we're very pleased that finally we have the opportunity to get recognition for all the fine work that the both of you have done for so many years and for the, your perseverance. So thank you for that. Um, Jenny, maybe a question to you as we're embarking on this low glycemic uh, claim opportunity in Canada, um, how can we best educate consumers about the benefits of low glycemic generally and for people with diabetes? Well, what I choose to do as a scientist and, and an academic is always respond to journalists quickly, promptly. I'm willing, I'm willing to do interviews, telephone, print, you name it. I think we have an important role as scientists to make sure that messages that are conveyed to the public uh, are reliable and accurate. If, we, if we're too busy and we don't want to do that, then it means you give double time to the, to the people out there who really are not experts in your field. So I would, I would recommend that people, scientists here, be willing to do that. After all, most of us are paid by the taxpayer and we have we have a moral obligation, I think, to do those things. So the Symbol program in Australia has played a really important role as a non-for-profit that promotes a scientific message about healthy, low-GI foods. Don't, don't leave it to the market forces. Take, take control right from the start. And I commend the Canadian Diabetes Association for the decision they've made. I think it's a proactive decision. And, you know, if you think back at how we didn't handle the low-fat claims very well, they went on jelly beans. And they, okay, um, we, we need to take control now, and this is the best step forward, an education program. Can I add to that from a practical perspective? So I mentioned in my presentation that Diabetes Australia and the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation of Australia were involved. And in the mid-90s, they started including information about the GI in their consumer magazines. So we were talking to the members and, and the membership of Diabetes Australia um, through the National Diabetes Services Scheme is very large as a proportion of the community. So we were educating about carbohydrates in general, talking about the different components of carbohydrate and glycemic glycemic index as a part of that. And we don't obsess around numbers. I think there's a tendency I've picked up from some of the diabetes conferences to talk about, you know, lowering, you know, choosing a food with a GI 54 versus a 53 or something like that. We don't focus on the numbers. We simply label foods low GI and we use the swap it, don't stop it approach. And I think we had a lot of discussion about cultural appropriateness and different diets that work. All we are telling people to do is to choose a healthy low GI choice within a food category as the GI was originally conceived around the carbohydrate exchange system. So really using it within that framework, which most people are familiar with anyway, and simply choosing the lower GI choice. So it's very easy to do so. And that's why awareness and understanding has improved very, very substantially. It's, it can be done. Uh, Bernard Venn, the University of Otago in New Zealand. I'd like to address my question to Sylvia, please, but perhaps the panel would also like to respond. 
Um, fructose has a low GI, as Alfred uh, has told us, um, and yet EFSA have allowed a health claim um, when fructose partially replaces sucrose in a food or a beverage. And there are major concerns around the consumption of fructose, um, particularly in North America. So I'd just like to have your opinion, please, as to um, what you think the, the ramifications might be of allowing a health claim um, and increasing the fructose intake in the population. Uh, I'm very pleased about this question because this is becoming really an issue in Europe. Um, the scientific opinion said replacing uh, glucose or sucrose by fructose decreases glycemic responses, which is scientifically true. There is very little discussion about that. Yeah? Then, as I said, the, evaluation is, uh, the health claims evaluation is not of a safety, but EFSA can comment on possible restrictions of use. And there, there was a comment saying that it has been observed that very high intakes of fructose may have some health consequences. So it was noted in the opinion. That was a message to risk managers to consider whether to authorize the claim or not, and in, under which conditions to do so. Um, the Commission of Member States decided to authorize, to authorize the claim. It's an authorized health claim in Europe now. And there has been a lot of reactions in respect to that claim from the media. We got a lot of uh, you know, questions from stakeholders, from the media, from consumer organizations. And now, um, you know, the latest news is nothing certain, but what could happen, you asked for my opinion, this is my opinion, what could happen is that the Commission uh, sends EFSA a, man a mandate to assess the safety of fructose. That could be one thing. We saw that already for some claims on caffeine and increasing uh, physical performance, attention, concentration, etc. Uh, in the authorization process, member states had concerns about the safety of caffeine. And then before authorizing anything, they sent EFSA a question regarding the safety of uh, caffeine, also in consumption within energy drinks, alcohol, and other in combination with physical exercise. This time, risk managers may decide to send the question post authorization. They can always do that. Can I add to Just a quick word. We have John at the back. I don't know, John, would you want to uh, make a comment here? I know John and I have been talking quite often about how healthy foods that may be high fiber may have increased amounts of fructose in them with high fiber and high volume and actually may have a benefit. John, do you want to say a few? All I would say is we published a series of systematic reviews and meta-analyses on this question, and I don't want to take any more time away. You can read those, and we can have a discussion about that this afternoon, because we're going to have a session on sweeteners, and Luke Tappy is going to talk about fructose, and I'm very happy to provide feedback then, but I don't want to take away from the glycemic index discussion we're having right now. So let's save that for this afternoon's session. Good. John's going to save that for this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. David, can I comment on that from a practical perspective? It's Alan over here. Oh, right. <laughs> yes, yes. Just in case you are thinking, or Bernard is implying, that people will be adding fructose to foods or companies will to lower the GI and make claims, both the nutrition profiling model of the GI Foundation and Fazans, of course, have fibre criteria and energy criteria, which will somewhat limit that possibility from happening. And certainly in Australia, we have not seen the addition of fructose to foods to make low GI claims in the real world. Hi, uh, Dave Lema, Unilever, the Netherlands. I guess this is a question to uh, Alan, but others might address it as well. I was slightly surprised to see uh, endorsement of sustained energy as an interpretation or a claim that could be uh, associated with low GI. I'm not really sure where that comes from. First of all, the blood glucose responses, uh, one would say is not an, a substantiation of that, but in most cases, a uh, lower GI is, is a completely lower uh, blood glucose response. You don't see an extended response, you usually see a lower response. Also, very few products actually test for uh, sustained uh, release of energy or sustained rate of absorption of the energy. And also, uh, in, as has been discussed, there is the possibility to add ingredients or have compositions uh, which specifically raise insulin uh, levels and therefore would further uh, decrease, uh, uh, decrease the, or, or raise, 
how should I say, decrease the slope of that curve or the descending slope of the curve. So is this really the right message to, to give to consumers? Is this substantiated? That wasn't a message that was given to consumers. That was consumer research as to what their understanding of the health benefits of GI. That was one of their uh, main understandings of what the health benefits were of GI. Uh, in res with respect to the substantiation, we actually have done a systematic literature review and meta-analysis of studies looking at uh, physical <coughs> performance, so sustained physical performance. There is actually a 20% increase in physical performance in endurance activities, which we consider to be quite good quality evidence to support that claim anyway. And um, I could show that to you later if you wish. So in that case, then, this, you're saying <coughs> that the substantiation of sustained energy is physical performance? Correct, yeah. Yeah, and last, last question. question. Fred Browns from Stichts University. Ellen, you say that this is what consumers understand sustained energy, but consumers don't understand GI. So if they understand sustained energy, somebody has told them. And I remember have, having seen packaging in, the, in Australia with cornflakes where you see the curves, and then the, the, the low GI curve is equivalent to sustained energy. It's written on the package. Uh, so. I, I believe that's communication and that's not, not merely an understanding, that's the way industry goes and personally I have big problems with the term sustained energy because it doesn't exist. It's simply, it is, it is marketing just like the word superfoods is marketing, sustained energy doesn't exist, a cell does not decide what type of energy is slow or fast, the cell uses ATP independent of what rate it is absorbed or it comes to the cell or whatever. And sustained energy in the mind of the consumer, if you want to measure what it is, can be a psychological feeling. I do not have the dip in the afternoon, so I, I have energy. Uh, it can be in the gut that you say, I want to look at the rate of absorption, and then something is slower absorbed, and then you can say, well, slow release is sustained energy. So I, I fully agree with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the previous uh, uh, question that sustained energy is a very difficult thing. And, and, and I think in terms of regulations, uh, for my perception, this is a no-go. From, from our perspective, of course, we uh, weren't promoting those claims as such. We simply put the label on with the GI symbol and the value. But uh, certainly that's the consumer understanding, as, as I said. And we have substantiated that with respect to sustained physical activity. And it is a quite large, both clinically and statistically significant improvement in sustained physical performance. And I'm happy to show that to you later. Fred. Let's, let's come down on the energy drinks, right, which are just caffeine and they make people feel better. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, if low GI makes you feel better, then you have sustained energy. I was just going to weigh in quickly and say I agree with the sustained energy thing. It's not a thing that I would want to see. But in defense, I would say that uh, if one takes foods that are slow release, such as lentils, which are lente carbohydrate in its extreme form, um, you will find you get a good second meal effect. You don't get a counter-regulatory response at, at four hours, which you often do with more refined carbohydrates. Uh, you get lower glucagon uh, and, and lower catecholamine secretion uh, than you do with a large meal of more refined carbohydrate. So, and you get an improved second meal effect. So, I mean, I'm not, going, I'm not making a plea for, for retaining sustained energy, but I am saying that it's an interesting concept, and I think that perhaps the discussion uh, it needs to be a bit more broad uh, than we've had right now. And so I think, so broad that I think we need lunch to have any further discussion. <laughs> so I'd like to thank all our speakers and panelists and all of those of you who asked questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>